right now with our guest speaker, Marie, a little bit of an intro. Very excited to have Dr. Mitsumoto here, who is a Wesley J. Howe Professor of Neurology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and the former director of the MDA ALS Clinical Research Center since 1999. In 1968, he graduated from Toho University School of Medicine in Tokyo. And from 1972, he pursued further medical and neuro neuro neurology training at Johns Hopkins University, Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland Clinic, and Tufts University. Hitting all the big ones there. In 1983, he became the director of the Neuromuscular Section and ALS Center at Cleveland Clinic. His career has focused on patient care and management, end-of-life issues, numerous clinical trials, biomarker development, and multi-site epidemiological studies. Dr. Mitsumoto, welcome. We are so excited to have you here today. Thank you very much. Okay. So I really am delighted to be invited and I'm so glad to uh, give you an opportunity to give a talk at this uh, Everything ALS. You know, we are completely different era or different time because after Buzo was uh, approved 1950, 19, excuse me, 1995, nothing happened 27 years, almost so depressing, but really we have uh, two oral medication or approved within one year. So truly this is the exciting time and the different, and we are looking for uh, just we chat, but we are looking for a final solution and all people working for LS can be out of job soon. So, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about today, uh, two uh, different topics. One is the hastening of the diagnosis of ALS and the other one is the muscle cramps. So I have to disclose, I have some grants, uh, NIHS, ALS Association, and some industries, and I'm advisory board uh, on Eli Liddy. <clears throat> and I'm going to start uh, hastening the diagnosis of ALS. This paper actually was published last year, July, in, in contemporary issue in neurology, in the Neurology Journal, uh, with uh, Ed Kasaskis and Zach Simmons together. So, um, as you see, uh, ALS start much earlier than symptom onset. We don't know when exactly, but years, years, even at the time of conception. And uh, we have internal environment and also external uh, uh, <clears throat> risk factors, but most importantly, genetics. We know gen genetic mutation, almost 30 mutation, but much more uh, gene influence in motor neurons are very complex. But environmental uh, risk and internal environment are um, modified by epigenetic process and gradually, gradually time on, motor neurons are stressed and the proteins are accumulated. At certain point, uh, motor neuron cannot take it anymore. And then symptom begins. And then we make a diagnosis and start the treatment. So that's the process we know. So, so it is well recognized that disease of ALS starts long before symptom onset, just I explained. So, Attempting to early diagnosis, nothing new or the concept attempt. So people agree that ALS is a chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease. It is a chronic disease. So why we have to rush? And the neurologists generally see patients as requested and as a scheduled allowed. This practice is part of the reason it takes approximately 12 months from onset of a new uh, weakness and to receive a clear diagnosis of ALS. This duration, roughly 12 months, has been uh, largely changed or shortened over the past 12 years, over a few, uh, few decades, actually. So, this is a busy slide, but what I'm trying to show you, there are several papers published how 
uh, along with PEGS to make a diagnosis after symptom onset, different um, investigators, different places, different population. And usually from uh, 1990s and more recently, it's roughly 16 months, 10 months, 15 months, some cases showing even 15, 30 months. But generally speaking, the global onset ARS is uh, shorter because of the specific uh, characteristic clinical features. So, so I would like to show this slide because when symptom onset, it takes some time, but uh, initiation of the diagnostic quest, usually seeing primary uh, general uh, practitioner, and uh, um, they might send to neurology, but might be sent to other specialists, such as the orthopedist or neurosurgeon and or ENT, and some special surgery sometimes done, and then uh, return to nothing happens, no improvement, therefore um, return to general neurologist, and subsequently um, comes to a specialist making diagnosis, then comes to multidisciplinary clinic, and medication uh, is given. So every time they order some test or appointment, you see there's a T, T sign, T sign everywhere, around the T sign, surrounded by circle, is a time. You order MRI, it takes days or week or even more. You, you make appointment to a neurologist, it never happens the next day, or we even a few days, it takes weeks, sometimes even more. So it, everything, when you do process, it, it takes time. That uh, is accumulated, the finally goes to somewhere around 12 or 14 months to make a diagnosis. So I would like to speak to Edith's Diagnostic Odyssey and arduous journey, for example, People are seeing multiple doctors, neurologists before the final diagnosis. Receiving multiple different diagnoses is not uncommon. And being operated for unnecessary surgeries for spinal radiculopathy, myelopathy, that means the spinal cord disease, entrapment neuropathy, symptoms are re retrospectively contributed to ALS. Some neurologists are reluctant to discuss the diagnosis of ALS with the patient and refer to other neurologists or other specialists. Some patients may be denial, may be in denial, and refuse to accept the diagnosis. Everything described above causes an acceptable delay in diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> so we have very little uh, information or data before symptom onset. However, in mutant SOD, transgenic mice, so-called ALS model, which is a specific uh, group of uh, disease SOD1, but uh, all the of motor neurons are already uh, showing, and so compensatory morphological changes occurs in motor neurons, and, and proceed a rapid loss of motor neurons, which coincide the symptom onset. And <clears throat> Patient with uh, actually uh, asymptom asymptomatic individual from a family's known pathogenic uh, SOD mutation, sudden drop of the muni, which muni is a motor unit count estimate, is uh, rapidly dropped before symptom onset. And the very unusual important study done long time ago, NAV roots, which is autopsy, innovating clinically normal muscles were found to have about a 20% reduction of nerve fibers, that means not motor neurons, and reduced the size of motor neuron cytons, means the cell bodies in autopsy study. So already, it's said to be normal area in, in affected patient is clearly affected motor neuron, motor nerves. And these results clearly indicate that a neuronal system was already affected, and the number of motor neurons have decreased, even when um, muscle uh, demonstrates normal strength. So, so also another thing is very important thing, uh, biomarker which we know neurofilament. Very good studies, class two, not class one, not randomized, 
and um, no no con no uh, randomized control. Yet two studies with class two evidence showed um, spinal fluid neurofilament amount, and the serum neurofilament uh, clearly found to have high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of ALS. Another study also showed the similar changes. And, and very interestingly also, familial ALS SOD mutation in subject without any, no symptom, but uh, spinal fluid neurofilament uh, known to be increased. So, so this red uh, figures, that letters showing a very important intriguing finding. In number two study, the serum neurofilament levels were significantly elevated well before the time of diagnosis in a patient with sporadic ALS. Means some subject goes to primary physicians and seeing some doctors, they collect the blood, blood, blood was saved and the serum is saved and the years later, some of them getting ALS. This is a huge study and those are samples before any symptoms, neurofilament is a clear, clearly abnormal. So that means neurofilament is very important diagnostic biomarker. So why we need to make a diagnosis early? What's the fuss? So disease modifying therapy we have now, and early initiation of therapy versus late initiation and making any differences. Yes, with the yes, with the Edarabon, yes, with the AMX0035, um, commercial name Revigrio, and also yes, with methylcobalamin. I'm going to show you. So this is a huge proactive database, about 5,000 uh, patients in clinical trials and at the baseline data and, and also end and result is survival, um, those who took a real zone, the those who did not take real zone, at the end, the significant change, 0 0.001, statistically so significant, but very interesting changes you, you see when people started the six months after symptom and the 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, Unbelievably, lines are not across, very close, but very different. Shorter the, uh, after the onset initiation of the real zone is much, much better than um, no medication. And this is so much uh, uh, revealing, sooner initiation gives a better result for survival. Next slide is Edarabon study. Edarabon study initially done in Japan, about um, uh, 200 patients. And this phase three study turns out to be completely negative. As you can see, I don't know, you can see the arrow here. And, and however, when you look at a certain group, LSFRX more than two on um, before entry of four months, so fairly rapidly moving, and also ABC is fairly good, more than 80%. When you show those groups, there's clearly some hint of improvement. However, when they included probable and definite diagnostic group um, and the duration of less than two years, this study included three years, but Shorten up after the symptom onset, um, this uh, <clears throat> retrospective study, that, I mean, um, show the clear evidence. So, so, so why this kind of um, ad hoc study is important? Because hypothesis generation, generation, so they not just let it go, but they repeat the same study based on um, those uh, prior studies. So what a study showed a duration of less than two years and um, uh, these are medication with the Darabon, yellow lines are placebo, 
and clearly uh, uh, <clears throat> showed, reproduced earlier studies. And based on this significant change in medication was approved in Japan, also came to the United States, and FDA approved this medication uh, several years ago. But of course, last year, oral medication was equally uh, approved. So earlier initiation clearly is better. So next one is <coughs> uh, really video, and this is uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, clearly uh, placebo was went down faster, but on medication moved slower. So ALSFRS decline is much uh, slower on this medication residual. And the most dramatic change is this slide on the right side. Initial six months was a study, uh, double blind placebo study, placebo controlled studies means six months, patient, uh, one group took medication, started, and one group, six months, no medication. However, after, at six months, everyone took medication. After uh, those, everyone took medication, they looked at survival at the end, um, six months of difference in survival. So what's the difference? Of course, one group started medication six months earlier, and the other group started medication six months later. So six months is a huge difference causing survival difference. And based on, again, these results, the medication was approved. And another, <laughs> excuse me, another interesting result is uh, mesocobalamin. This is an active form of vitamin B12. And they studied um, initially lower dose, 25 milligram, and high dose, 50 milligram. And there's no almost no difference in earlier studies. However, they analyzed and what went uh, ad hoc analysis and showing post hoc, uh, we say post hoc, showing when we looked at people who entered 12 months after the onset, much shorter period compared to rest. Initial studies, 36 months, and those post hoc studies clearly uh, showed big difference between 50 milligram and the placebo. 23 milligram, 25 milligram is close to placebo. So based on this uh, post hoc analysis, they repeated. That means patient less than 12 months after symptom onset. And uh, earlier studies was published in JAMA Neurology and clearly those high dose of mesocobalamin um, declining of ADSFR is much slower than um, a placebo, which is only very short period of 16 months. But now they are finishing up a, a survival studies and, and uh, uh, Dr. Um, Kazi reported the World Federation of Neurology. They repeated the same result. That means when you start medication sooner after dying, after symptom onset, you can get profound benefit and significant benefits compared to later on later onset initiation of the treatment. So benefit of early di diagnosis is so clear. For example, approved medication, Ruzo, Edaravan, and also real video, as I said, has showed delayed functional progression and also prolonged survival. And also preliminary evidence also shows that uh, mesocobalamin IM injection again slowed uh, ADSFS decline, also prolonged survival. And, and also um, another study showed early start of multidisciplinary clinical management and NIV is likely to prolong survival. And also with the diagnostic delay, the patients are more likely to receive unnecessary diagnosis tests and are more likely to develop some depressive symptoms. Early diagnosis can save medical costs and improve the patient's psychological well-being. 
and effects of neuroprotective treatment must be given when motor neurons are still alive and reversibility is functioning based on study with SOD transgenic mice. So benefit is so clear when you make it diagnosis early. So, so what happened uh, graphically looking at disease starts at some point and then de slowly, slowly declining, but you don't see any declining, you don't feel any declining because continuously we innovate it and compensation mechanism going on. But at certain point, compensation, axonal sprouting reduced, decline, at given up. And then motor neuron uh, dose is rapidly progressing at the symptom onset. And then when you make diagnosis sooner, red arrow, usually start of course treatment sooner. That means better benefit in terms of a slow decline and long survival compared to delayed diagnosis. And this is a blue line, delayed diagnosis. The benefit is much lower than earlier diagnosis. So, 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 it is so important to make diagnosis clear. We have to know, particularly physician, primary physician, neurologist, and has to know how we can suspect the diagnosis. For example, rapid weight loss um, of undetermined cause, nothing cancer, no thyroid, um, or uh, unexplained fatigue. Again, no cancer, no thyroid, no depression. So, so unexplained fatigue. Unexplained shortness of breath is also, we have to think, non-cardiac, non-lung disease, what's happening? Undetermined speech problem or swallowing problem. When you go to EMT, um, invariably they say acid reflex disorder, but those are medication doesn't help. And I suspect uh, area diagnosis, focal weakness, arm, hand, leg, without the pain, which is again, very important clue. Fasciculation or muscle cramps with the, with the weakness. Without weakness, it happens to anyone, but with the weakness, again, we have to think the possibility of ALS. So, so there is a clearly um, medication developed for, for SMA. You may not know SMA, spinal muscular atrophy in the infant, born with, and diagnosed very early, and then infant die within one or two years, mostly. But with this new medication, what happened? Butterfield said, the profound impact of early persymptomatic treatment has led to the creation of neurogenetics urgency for newly identified patients with SMA. A novel problem for neurologists more accustomed to a, a more methodical approach to diagnosis and care. We are all blamed for chronic, neuro, chronic neurodegenerative disease such as ALS. We don't rush, we don't make diagnosis sooner. That's our custom and this is a tradition, but we have to change. This is not urgent, I mean, like a uh, stroke, yet, we have to think our mind to move a diagnosis much, much sooner to make, to start early treatment. We have a lot of challenges. We have to do a lot of things. For example, we have to use the newest diagnostic criteria and we have to use the neurofilament. And the neurofilament cannot be measured routinely in most hospitals. We have to develop those measurement techniques and genetic testing is, should be done every time to facilitate the diagnosis in certain cases. And also we include pra uh, practicing neurologists via communication. We have to disseminate, to educate them, educate us among our, uh, us, including primary physician, incorporate the need for hastening diagnosis of, uh, into uh, AAN, American Academy of Neurology, practice uh, guideline and the quality measure. So I am in charge of now American Academy of ALS Practice Guidelines it just started, and we have to incorporate such important inform information. 
neuromuscular uh, or ALS disease organization, such as ALS Association, and if you are ALS kind of organization, enhance uh, to make early diagnosis. Because now we will have more medication, sooner initiation medication clearly better benefit. So, so this is uh, just the first presentation. And then I'm going to move next uh, presentation. Uh, I show you a beautiful flower. So shakuyaku, a peony. The other one is uh, glyco, right? Glyco, well, um, glyco is actually kanzo. And uh, so, so, so how we deal with muscle cramps, a TJ68, a kampo. Um, so what is a kampo? Uh, before talking about kampo, I'd like to show you muscle cramps. Muscle cramps is not uncommon, actually very frequent. If people experience, people with ALS experience, you can see some focal, severe muscle cramp. Muscle cramp means muscle uh, contraction, so local, focal, and associated with sometimes severe pain, abrupt onset. Sometimes you cannot stop, so painful. So muscle cramps in ALS, we did some studies long time ago. Um, what we do, besides, of course, weakness, um, patient uh, uh, with this kind of disease reported fatigue. Most patients complain fatigue and muscle stiffness. And also 74% complained muscle cramp. So muscle cramp is not an uh, unusual problem. Muscle cramps are common and sometimes disabling symptoms. With most patients have this uh, muscle cramps I was just uh, saying here. And also muscle cramps are <clears throat> sometimes pre presenting symptoms in up to 20% of the patient. So they come to the doctor uh, because of bad muscle cramps. It turns out to be ALS. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, cramps may often see the weakness. Is that true? And at some point, muscle cramps declining disappears with disease uh, progression. Patient with muscle cramps are not uh, properly managed, and there are no effective medication for muscle cramps. There have been few uh, clinical trials uh, that specifically target the muscle cramps in ALS. Most most recently, maxillotin was tested by Dr. Oskarson. Uh, he is very much interested in muscle cramps and they found the benefit. But also another study done, Dr. Bison and the his team, maxillotin didn't show any benefit in slowing down the disease in ALS, yet uh, had a benefited, benefited for muscle cramps. So, so now, uh, once again, this picture, shakuyaku, uh, peony, and <clears throat> glycy lysa uh, is actually kanzo. We look at the net roots, and the root will be combination of shakyaku kanzo is, is a, a medication. So TJ68 is a name, and it is a kampo medicine. What is a kampo? Kampo is a Japanese traditional herbal medicine that originated from ancient China around the fifth century, came to Japan. There are many, more than 140 Kampo medications. Kampo is prescribed by doctor, a uh, medical doctor in Japan and um, <clears throat> covered by medical insurance, of course, controlled by Japanese FDA. All 81 medical schools in Japan provide education on Kampo. In Japan, Kampo medicine and the traditional Western medicine in dual, uh, dual uh, process. Approximately 90% of these use Kampo in their practice and prescribe in combination of regular Western medicines. Many experimental and clinical data on Kampo are now being uh, studied in recent years and published and receiving worldwide uh, interest uh, 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 and publications. TJ68 has been widely prescribed 
for the treatment of muscle cramps. It is in fact one of the most broadly used kampo medicine in Japan. It is not uncontrolled uh, herbal medicine. This is highly regulated, controlled by Japanese FDA, and they now know which chemicals might be effective in these uh, kampo herbal medication, and they are controlling how to make in terms of contamination with heavy, metal, heavy metals, microbes, et cetera, et cetera. So very uh, regulated uh, control system to produce this uh, kampo medicine. So, so, so uh, how about this uh, uh, TJ68, how did I know about this? And I have to tell you a little story because I had a fellow from Japan and observing our ALS uh, activity at ALS clinic. And he had a hobby to run mountains. Whenever he runs mountains, he said he got some muscle cramps, severe muscle cramps. He said, I'm going to take the shakya kanzoto with water and very quickly muscle cramps go away. So I had this story he told me and I said, wow, this should be tried in ALS. That's the beginning of almost 10 years ago, and wanted to introduce this medication to our patient. In fact, TJ68 has been mentioned as a potential drug for the, uh, treating muscle cramps in patients with ALS in Japanese ALS practice guidelines, and which is prepared by Japanese Society of Neurology. And <clears throat> as long as I know, no neurologist or patient in Western countries are aware of, of the existence of the compo, such as TJ68. So we are very interested in studying this medication for patients with ALS to see if we can treat it, uh, different muscle cramps, difficult muscle cramps. So, <clears throat> so unique features of TJ68 clinical trials we are doing. For example, this is double blind placebo controlled study and particular unique design, so-called personalized, personalized N of one design. I'm going to introduce shortly. An introduction of Japanese Kampo to Western medicine, a broader population, not just Western, but, but broader population. And traditional trial pathway we take in the United States, uh, got FDA approval for um, investigational new drug license. And the use of comprehensive muscle cramp scale, which has been developed um, for this particular study. We developed muscle cramp scale. It has been validated against the cramp diary. And we did the test retest by intra, means individual test retest, and also different uh, rater, inter rater, and also in person when you see the patient. Also, telephone based administrations are uh, really equal with study. And there is also no change in muscle cramps in four weeks when we did four weeks later with time. So these are Columbia uh, muscle uh, cramp scale, premetric scale. And we are talking about what the trigger is the muscle cramps and the frequency of muscle cramps, the location of muscle cramps, and the severity of, uh, severity of most cramps, and also overall muscle cramps affecting uh, overall daily activity. This is visual analog scale zero none to severe uh, 10. So this is administrative structure and the Tsumura uh, funded all entire studies, but I am a sponsor on the PI and the FDA gave us the IND. And I asked Dr. Oskarson, just I mentioned briefly, I mean, shortly before, at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, working together, and the study is uh, regulated, of course, watched by DSMD uh, <clears throat> Data Safety Monitoring Board, and the data goes to Data Management Center, and, and subsequently data analyzed by blind advanced statistician, and the uh, study is also monitored by um, Barrow Neurological Institute, and hopefully 
we can find the benefit on the publication. So this is the just the amount of pairs of crossover, and we give it medication, uh, TJ68, and then middle two phase, the placebo, placebo, and TJ68. The other group is the start with the placebo, TJ68, TJ68, and the placebo. When you look at the more uh, detail, you see this is N of one design. Individually, we can do uh, placebo active medication a crossover repeatedly. And then primary outcome is actually a visual analog scale, overall uh, uh, benefit from uh, crumps. And also sample size 22 participants and with 85% power, power and uh, statistical significance of 5%. So yet uh, may, they may uh, get off uh, with dough, et cetera. So we have, with the safety factor, 26 patients aiming to, to enroll. So the so outcomes are one, two outcomes. One is the primary safety, because this is the first time into the United States. And primary efficacy endpoint is muscle crumps, um, overall daily activity. And then secondary endpoint, I will show you several of them um, in, in the next uh, couple of minutes. So primary safety endpoint is safety. We have to make sure this medication is safe. We know this medication already is safe in Japan because uh, at least a couple of a million people take the uh, Shakya Kondoto or TJ68 without a much major safety issue. Therefore, safety is not issue yet. It's the first time. Therefore, we make sure it is indeed safe and, and, and monitored by blinded investigators. Everyone is blinded. For example, PI investigators are blinded. Study coordinators are blinded. Medical safety officers are blinded. Also, if any issue occurs, to giving a treatment, all medical consultants also are blinded. Primary efficacy endpoint is a cramp scale, analog scale called affecting the overall day, daily activity, zero to uh, 10. And um, we check second week of each treatment phase, not the first week, but the second week uh, with the treatment. And the second week of the treatment, we, we compare uh, the same individual put on the medication and off medication, any difference between those placebo and active medication. And we use, of course, muscle uh, cramp scale and FDA order, FDA told us just to use uh, simplified analog scale rather than uh, complicated muscle cramp scale. So I was very disappointed, but uh, we included muscle cramp scale as a secondary out, uh, outcomes. And we use cramp diary, how many cramps, where, kind of diary is also used as a secondary uh, endpoint. Uh, cramp pain scale, most cramp yeah, but, uh, are painful. Therefore, we use how is the pain besides the cramp. We're going to check those uh, pain uh, degree. Also, LSFRS uh, R, is, I'm sure everyone knows this LSFRS R, and just make sure this is either safety-wise, not declining too fast, or if there's any hint of improvement, we don't expect, but uh, LSFRS is oh so important. Therefore, we use LSFRS R is one of the secondary um, outcomes. So the other one is the clinical global impression of change. We ask a patient, do you think it's anything better? And the scale, you can one or two plus, or getting worse, minus one, minus two. And also equally evaluate the, uh, do this global impression of change by themselves. So patient, patient themselves and and evaluate as um, evaluation to impression coming out. And, and then ALSAC-5 is the shortest quality of life uh, indicate, uh, indi 
um, uh, indicator we, we check. And the other one is a goal attainment scale, which is first time I believe used in ALS clinical trials. I, I'm very much interested in because we speak to the patient and how cramps affect their life. For example, some patients say, I have to sleep throughout the night without a cramp. Because of a cramp, I wake up and I have to give massage and stand, walk and so forth. A sleep is interrupted. So if sleep is improved with uh, less cramps, that's my uh, goal. Well, some patients may say, well, when I type, I have always a cramp. Therefore, if I, I have no cramps in my hand, I can keep typing, that will be great. Kind of individually different goal. So we set up goal and scale. There's no change, zero, improve one, more improve two, but getting worse. When I uh, wake up three times a night with this medication, it's clearly getting worse. Well, minus one, minus two, kind of goal attainment scale is very interesting. So, so now we have some inclusion criteria, for example, patient has uh, ALS uh, disease, motor neuron disease, and uh, at least uh, five muscle cramps per week. We set what daily cramps, but uh, turns out they're a little difficult, so now decrease five muscle cramps. The age is 20 to 84, and has to be ready to be uh, early stage, that means if we see the more than 60%, and uh, can able to swallow liquid because this is liquid, a medication powder has to be resolved in a lukewarm water and uh, a caregiver should be available. And of course, the patient has to be uh, able to give informed consent. There are many other uh, inclusion criteria, but I'm not going to all detail, but it is everything is written here. But also we have some exclusion uh, criteria because um, uh, if anyone allergic to uh, uh, peony or uh, glycine riser uh, cannot take, and also medication um, causing some pseudo aldosteronism because with aldosterone, patient has hypertension, low potassium, and those things are no good. So there's a history of those histories or uh, hypokalemia, high blood pressure may not be a good candidate. And uh, also if potassium is low, because this medication may cause low potassium, therefore we avoid those who have already low potassium. And then blood pressure has to be normal. So there are again, uh, uh, several very important uh, criteria that exclude us to uh, ask a participant to participate because, because of, for example, sodium levels normal and bicarbonate uh, 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 less than 19 is no good. And there are so, so, so many uh, exclusion criteria uh, 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 listed. Why? Because again, in Japan, everyone takes those, many people take the shake consult apparently, but again, this is a clinical trial. The first time in the United States, we are very, very cautious to make sure study is safely done. So these are busy, busy slide, and we do screening with the baseline and the period one. After period one, one week uh, washout, then goes to period two, and then wash out the period of one week, then goes to period of three, and then wash out one week, and the final period of four weeks, and then uh, end, 11 weeks total study, and every first time, two weeks, and three weeks, three weeks, they come and do evaluation, and those, those scales and so forth are done. So that's a uh, uh, unique uh, N of one clinical trials to evaluate the muscle cramps. Hopefully we can develop newer medication. Uh, probably takes several years, but hopefully uh, can be done in the future. So, so um, 
So I think we finished despite of all the uh, trouble with the slides. I think we finished and went through very fast. And I'm sure you have some questions. I'm happy to, to answer. Again, um, we started the, the studies and included already uh, several patients and uh, uh, probably hope we can finish within one year uh, from now on. Once again, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mitsumoto, for that presentation. That was extremely informative. I know there was a lot of questions that were asked during your presentation. So uh, Priyanka and Brian, two of our fellows, are going to ask them, and I'm going to turn it over to them. All right. So to start, our first question is, would validation of biomarkers lead to being accepted as the current accepted value? Also, for a follow-up, would this dramatically accelerate diagnosis? Yes. I strongly believe neurofilament is very important. And people said that this is non-specific. For example, if you get the patient with multiple sclerosis, brain injuries, and Parkinson's disease, and any other brain disease, neurofilament is in, in, increased because of brain damage and tissues are destroyed. So neurofilament spill over in the spinal fluid and also in the blood. So it's non-specific. However, when you have a certain clinical constellation, weakness, circulation, and clinically typical or atypical areas, we are thinking those uh, group of symptoms with a positive neurofilm. Really, you have to think such diagnosis. And I think it's maybe we may over diagnose it, but my point is treatment should be started as soon as possible because it is so clear the sooner the better uh, the, in terms of getting the benefit. So, so I think neurofilm is the very important proper study done. Yes, we have to continue, but neurofilament measurement should be widely available. I'm not sure I answered uh, your question. Um, Could you stop more. sharing your screen, doctor? Excuse me? Could you stop okay. sharing your screen? Okay, 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 good. Oops. I don't know how many. Stop sharing. Okay, right. sorry. Okay. See, no you told me I'm technically good. Now I proved myself technically poor, but now I'm feeling well. You're awesome. Perfect. No worries, Dr. Mitsumoto is perfect. Also, next question is why are neurologists not ruling out ALS first before other neurologic diseases? Also, as a follow up, could this change shorten the time of diagnosis of ALS? I think so. If they're looking for, think of it. But the problem is, until now, ALS is a disease of no cure, no medication. And so much we, we are told this is devastating disease. In Japan, they call this is um, uh, the most uh, 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 impossible disease. Uh, and anyway, so so people don't want to talk. And uh, um, doctors would, would be afraid to talk to the patient. And some neurologists, of course, said, oh, you have ALS, you, uh, you have a, this, this such a disease, bad disease, and so forth. Some neurologists like that. But the most doctors who are compassionate and knows the patient feeling, empathy and so forth, they try not to talk about. That's a big mistake. Now we have a treatment. You have to change your conception. That comes education. We have to educate ourselves, the neurologists, and to deal with ALS much, much quicker and start the treatment faster. That's the way. And I think uh, it is a long way to go, but uh, uh, practice guidelines change, and uh, uh, 
everything Aries or Aries Association, any organization, you see, there's no, no, no doubt we need a better medication. We're putting every effort to develop a new medication, but we have to start those medications sooner. If you don't, if you don't make a diagnosis sooner, the benefit cannot be obtained. So that's, that's my feeding and the message. Thank you. Um, our next question was regarding your slides, slides 12 and 13. Were there subjects who had increased survival time shown in those slides? Shall I go back? Um, you yes, can. Slide. Yes, I, I show the slide. You mean ready video? That's a question? Yes. Yes. The ready video slide, once again, they start a treatment, double blind. One group would active medication, real medication, real video. The other medication, fake medication, placebo, for six months. Six months later, everyone got the medication. Even placebo, started placebo, six months later, start to active medication, real video. Waited 30 and 40 months later, those who started medication six months earlier did clearly better survival benefit about six months. So so I hope I made myself clear. If you start effective medication sooner, you got benefit better. So so that's the reason you cannot wait. You have to start medication. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Next question is is as a follow up, is really really real Sorry, readily available in the U.S. It's red, now uh, readily available. Yes. So, so, so you have to talk to the doctor, and and the problem, of course, those medication, new medication, is always a very expensive, without any doubt. So you have to get a, a medical insurance approval, get it started, and uh, um, so, so I think, I think it's. I think it has to be titrated at the beginning, but I think you should start medication. It takes, everything it takes time. So usually what we do is at the clinic, send the information to insurance company, LSFRS score, FVC score, diagnosis certainty, and so forth. We send to insurance, get approval. Nothing happens day or two. So you, you have to diligent and, and, keep asking the insurance company, where's the approval, where's the approval? And I think is I think it's just, we, we cannot sit tight and wait in a long time. We have to move forward. Thank you. Um, our next question is, since there is variation in progression and time since diagnosis, is there a way to distinguish whether the relevant variable is time since diagnosis or disease status at the time of treatment initiation? <clears throat> That's a very complicated question. And we know who are better, who are worse in prognosis. This is not, not truly scientific. There's a publication there, for example, younger person is better, and uh, uh, slower disease is better, and um, more upper motor neurons are better. So, so that sort of things we know, and some studies are done. The faster progression, if you make a diagnosis within a few months, quickly, disease is so moving fast, you cannot um, ignore, we, we are forced to make a diagnosis. Those are proper prognosis, generally speaking. So, 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 but those are very complicated issues. And what I'm saying, saying is based on my experience. I think this, however, young ALS is clearly better, which repeatedly, repeatedly shown. So, 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 again, I have to tell you, there are many uh, patient groups here, therefore I, I want to tell you. We just are trying to publish a paper and uh, those who treat food, food, a loss of weight is no good. You have to maintain weight. Very, very important. The food gives us a high glycemic, means high glucose 
content, high glucose content in the blood is better food. So, so, so I think it's, to me, ALS and the diabetes completely go opposite. And weight loss is good for diabetes. Weight loss for ALS is by the sign. You have to maintain. Take a lot of sugar is good for ALS. Sugar, I mean sugar inducing food. And again, not for diabetes. There is not the proven but uh, this is probably eventually metabolic disease and uh, motor neurons are most susceptible to those metabolic changes. All right, perfect. Next question is, is there any help with genetic ALS or familiar ALS? Say it again, what's the question? So my question was, is there any, is there any help with genetic? Help? help? With help, yes. Right, of course. Just new medication was approved for SOD, SOD1 mutation by Biogen. And uh, this is, a, of course, a very small group. 20% 20% of familial ALS is SOD mutation. 40% <clears throat> plus is C9 mutation. And the rest are many, many things. And still many are unknown. So now we have new medication uh, anti-sense oleonucleotide, the intrathecal injection was approved by FDA. Uh, uh, well, limited approval, but anyway. So, so, so I think it's, um, genetic mutation is the first disease uh, we can find better treatment. But uh, amazing, even for sporadic illness, we have uh, three medications which have been approved, Rizal, and the Daravon and the Velvilia. So, so, so we are again, as I said at the beginning, completely different time era. Thank you. Um, someone has asked that their neuro neurologist recommended a magnesium supplement for cramps. Do you think this is a valuable supplement? Sure, why not try? It might work. I see a lot of patients said, um, uh, magnesium works. Often magnesium is tried for regular muscle, muscle cramps. So so anything potentially helps when you try. One week, two weeks, it's getting better, fine. Doesn't help, stop. Try. Magnesium is nothing uh, unless you take tons of magnesium, not, not much harm to the body. Perfect. Next question is, has any correlation been noted between location of early muscle cramps and location of onset of initial ALS weakness? As a follow-up, could cramps in the leg be an early symptom of arm onset ALS? Well, I don't think anyone study. Very interesting things to study. And uh, um, so, 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 so many things we, we need to know, but to my knowledge, no one studied, so I cannot answer. All right. Um, and our last question, since we're going right up to time here, would be, will TJ68 be available? And if so, where can, where can it be purchased since it's currently? Right. This is solely regulated by FDA. We cannot uh, get TJ68 to the common uh, market is not allowed in the United States. If you go to Japan, you can, you have to ask the Japanese physician to prescribe, you can get medication. And uh, again, regulated by, by Japanese FDA and the physician has to uh, prescribe. And the problem is, Shakya Kanzoto might be available uh, in, in, uh, in Chinese of our medicine, but I don't know how they, they are uh, properly, safely regulated. Well, even though it may not be available to everyone here yet, it's a domino effect. And so whatever research comes out of it, it can only lead to good. So thank you so much. I know it's, it's late where you are right now. Um, we are 
entering the moment of our open forum, you're more than welcome to stay, but we understand you're extraordinarily busy. So if you have to bounce off, we understand that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Hope to see you again. Bye -bye.